Hey there, murder hobos. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And we all know that straight up murder in every monster you come across is the best way to deal with every monster you come across. But I have a radical notion. Maybe it's not. So let's learn some different ways to engage with your enemies on this web DM. This episode is sponsored by Ink and Liar with their Stargazer's Guide to Aurora, live on Kickstarter now. Build characters empowered by celestial bodies using their Zodiac character system. Get 12 subclasses, 3 races, and 23 locations. Gorgeous Zodiac-inspired add-ons and more. We've known Ink and Liar for years as amazing artists and game designers on Patreon. Stretch goals are already being unlocked to add adventure modules to this already 250 plus page book, folks. Back it on Kickstarter now and you get it in January. Link is here in the comments and description. Okay, Jim, so let's let's have a conversation on behalf of all those DMs out there that would really like to uh, show off all the aspects of their their world and lore building with their monsters because you know yeah. sometimes you you want your monster to talk to the players and they just kill it and then that's it like well that's just it you yeah. could have learned something but you know <laughs> there's, there's there's so, so, one. <laughs> yeah yeah so what what uh, let's 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 delve into a conversation to help 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 DMs kind of show off their monsters a little bit more so that they're just, you know, because there's options, right? Like you, yes. there's many yeah. paths through many this. Paths. Certainly. And so, uh, so where, where do you start when you think about, uh, when you think about like portraying your monsters in a way that, uh, that, you know, kind of stands in the face of just straight up killing them at, at first sight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, for one, there are monsters in the monster manual that have you know, intelligent scores and speak languages for reason, you know, and, mm -hmm. and like in the, in one of the more common criticisms of, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons is, is that, you know, it's just a combat game. It's, it's really just meant for combat and, and, you know, hack and slash and monster fighting is, is all you really ought to do with it to do anything different is to fight against the rules. And you just shouldn't do that. You shouldn't try that hard. And to that, I say, booey. That's ridiculous. And what? And how boring. This is right. Good, yeah. There's <laughs> you know, kids watching, Jim. <laughs> right. Goodness. Oh, you know, like if that's if that's the limits of your conceptual horizon for D and D that that com that it's a combat game where where you just you slaughter monsters uh, because they're in the monster manual. They have an evil alignment, and that's okay. Like, all right, you have your own fun. I don't I don't want to crap on your game. I personally right. find that way to play uninspiring and unfulfilling and i like the idea of that the monsters inhabit this world too that they're a part of the world that they're that they are perhaps natural creatures found in it the equivalent of dinosaurs right like they're just creatures that have evolved in this world or were created by the gods or something like that or that mm -hmm. even the monsters who are like clearly supernatural in nature and like represent some sort of fear or worry or, or or something you know they have a symbolism to them like even that uh I, I find the ability to like talk to them and interact with them inspiring and interesting and opens up other options for play and so as a dm i try to encourage this by like never once thinking of my monsters as just things to kill they're not meat bags to 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 destroy they're not uh you know, video game uh, sprites that are going to follow a script and, and fight till they're done. They are living, mostly, uh, entities, creatures within this world and have a degree of agency and motivation and the like because I'm trying to portray a living place that the players can interact with. And, and that's where I start from uh, for these kind mm -hmm. of campaigns. Is that they're, they're more than just monsters. They have... Uh, a role-playing opportunity for me as a DM. And if I take that seriously, that's that's where this starts. Right. Definitely more than just monsters. And we are more than just a YouTube channel. If you want to support us, you can head on over to Patreon. For a very small fee, you get a whole other podcast every week and a whole host of other uh, things that we let our patrons see first. So, uh, you know, check that out and don't think we're monsters for, yet, for asking. Um, so, Jim... <laughs> Yeah. One place 
that I that we love. One thing we love talking about all the time are factions. Yeah, and factions are a great way to make sure that your monsters and your 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 villains that your 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 players are coming up against they don't just uh-huh. steamroll uh-huh. them because you know factions <laughs> they have power they have reach they have focus right. they have ambition and maybe you can align that ambition with your players or you know even yeah. though they're not the good guys so yeah let's let, right. let's talk let's let's wax factions here for a second yeah let's talk about it. so like let's talk about the wax fa- faction right. I'm talking about it. like they melt under the, the heat every time <laughs> the the classic example of, of faction play is something like uh, keep on the borderlands there's this oh, yeah. valley uh where the caves of chaos are and each of the caves has a different tribe of, of evil humanoids in it and and they're all working against each other and, and there's this sort of equilibrium there and then the players come in and they disrupt it and and like for me when i ran this and this was like the first dnd uh, adventure I ever ran, uh, keep on the borderlands. I looked at it and I went, well, they're just like, clearly these are just pe- a different type of people. And you know, the kobolds in this group and the goblins in this, or the you know hobgoblins in that group, like they have wants and motivations and goals and desires and, and an organization to help see that. And if I just present them all as having their own, like point of view, their own uh, aspirations, their own things that they want, and then let the players decide which ones to align with, which ones that they are just like, okay, well, we can, we can side with this group over against the others. Like, yeah. you're not prescribing any one way that a faction should be approached, right? Like, it's, it's one thing to go like, oh, this is the evil cult that's trying to do something obviously terrible and bad, and, and you know, any right-thinking and clear-headed person in the setting would want to stop them. Like that's a kind of a cartoonish evil that that I don't like in my games, just because it's very simplistic and and I, I use it very sparingly. Mustache. You're like twirling your mustache, tying <laughs> tying someone to train tracks, or you know, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> and I much rather like a faction that's like, listen, they just want things, and sometimes that's going to come up against like other factions that want something, or or they're in competition, or someone's going to work at cross purposes, but. Only rarely is it like obviously evil that they're doing something. So mm-hmm. the more of these you have, say three to four, that have competing interests, competing goals, different resources, but they're not like obviously evil, then the players can look at it and go, I don't, which one do we want? Which one, you know, do, you know, are, can we trust them? Should, are they going to betray us? The answer is yes. That's part yes, of the fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, not before you betray them first. Uh, but that there's if just this, yeah. right, this, this, <laughs> the mixing up, the disrupting of the equilibrium there is what leads to really satisfying play. And because it's not like we're just going to go in and kill them all, the assumption is we're going to go in and, and murder them and just like leave a bloody mess, mm-hmm. then the players like have to play carefully. They have to ask questions. They have to yeah. engage in intrigue. It's a faction. They're not dealing with a single monster. They're dealing with an organization that can marshal its resources against a threat like a, you know, pissant little party who goes around kicking in doors and killing everything. Then, like, that's when the big goons show up, right? <laughs> that's, that's when mm-hmm. there's repercussions. And so by having a setting that has factions of varying power, you know, the, you know, you're not, everything's not like level adjusted for you and not everything has an obvious, like good or evil bent to it already setting yeah. the playing field for like the players have to be careful how they move through this environment. Most, most definitely. Uh, and I, I, I have a recommendation for everybody out there. Warrior, if you have any, if you have access to that show on HBO Max, uh-huh. It is an amazing exploration of that because mm. it's basically gangs of New York and San Francisco, but you have the Hopway, you have the Long Z, you got the Fong Hai. Those are all the, the 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 Chinese and Mongolian factions, and then you have the police. You have the Irish who are tired. You know they're mad because yeah. they're losing. Their, like it's just an amazing way of seeing all these factions interacting, and and obviously there's people that just want it. Why can't we just roll up in there and just kill them? And it's like, well, there's there's reasons. Yeah. Like we have yeah, conflicting. Reasons. Yeah, there's treaties, there's all these things, and it, it's just a it's just a great like uh, illumination on ways mm-hmm. for factions to interact, 
And yeah. that's all, like, the whole time I was watching it, that's all I was thinking of. And so being oh, here yeah, in this yeah. conversation, it's just like, yeah, I see it all now. Yeah, you it's clear it, as yeah. day. Clear as day. This kinds of thing works really well in a dungeon because you're on oh, the yeah. monster's home turf. Right, like this is where they live. This is these are their homes. And whether you take the approach that that like, say, kobold and goblin are like are like full on people, which is what I do, because they that's how they're described, uh, or that they are like creatures of the underworld and, and you know monstrous supernatural creatures, like you can still have the faction play in that. Uh, the 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 context for it changes a bit, but like the reason why the the kobolds can't just go fight the goblins because they're in conflict with each other is because that's going to leave them vulnerable to the orcs right like yeah. they're going to take losses in that fight just so exactly. happens some new pcs arrived on the scene who we could potentially entice to go do our dirty work for us and mm -hmm. okay well then we get to the goblins and the goblins are like wait a minute the kobolds sent you here like oh no we can do better than that we can we can we can meet their offer and exceed it and now you've already gotten to the point where like the, the enemies aren't obviously going to start fighting immediately. They yeah. see value in the PCs. There's a reputation factor involved. If the PCs going around killing everyone, then that means everybody's going to kill them on site. And there's way more monsters than there are PCs in a dungeon. And so yeah. like set this up and let your players know about it. And now they're, they're going to have to be a bit more careful in how they use physical force and, and violence. Um, and then you can always have monsters attack them, you know, for the action and the combat. You don't want to eliminate combat entirely, but you can go a mm -hmm. long way towards reducing it and encouraging more interaction by presenting uh, complex and morally gray factions. Yeah. And, of course, with more interaction and action, there's going to be reaction. Oh, so. Yeah. Let's let's get on to the to uh, the reaction role here because this is a this is something that we like this is almost like a tenet of of web DMs oh, yeah, yeah. like DM yeah. philosophy. We talk about reaction roles all the time because it is. Yeah. Don't wait for that player to make a charisma check to try to woo them. They're gonna have an initial reaction. They're gonna start from a place, right? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So like two two things that I like to use to set up encounters with. Uh, you know, monsters or factions or whatever is a DM. Like one of them is motivations. Um, what what are the what do these creatures want? Um, in other words, like what are they doing right now? But the reaction role is a number one. It's a surprise for me as a DM, right? Like yeah, I'm gonna roll this this two d six and check on my chart to, to determine like the initial starting reaction of this particular group of monsters to meeting the PCs at this moment. The PCs have not had a chance yet. To, to leverage their social skills in this matter. They, they, they have not spent enough time to warrant a charisma check with this particular group of monsters. And depending on how I've arranged the table for 2d6, this could lead to instant combat as you, know, you come across monsters that are on patrol, looking for enemies, trying to protect their territory. Uh, or it could be that you come across a group that are you know, chilling hanging out, trying to avoid some work. You know, they don't yeah, want to be found Friday. out. So yeah, to, it's Friday. You, know, like, you ain't got no job. You ain't got shit Friday. to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, to, to back it up a bit, the reaction role is a mechanic from uh, classic versions of Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, to bring it forward, um, I use it to set the stage for what the PCs can accomplish. It essentially sets the DCs for any persuasion or intimidation or, or the like sort of checks and a reaction roll is 2d6 uh, you roll them and you compare them to a chart that is usually broken down into categories that has a result for if you roll a two another result for if you roll three through a five and then another result for six through eight which is where most of your rolls are going to land and then another one for nine through eleven and then a roll uh, a category for twelve so you have like five uh, uh, categories two is the worst it's like violently hostile Right, attacks yeah. on site. Three through five is like they're unhelpful. They're hostile. They don't. They're not going to fight you necessarily, but they mm -hmm. might. And for the most part, like in, unless you like really impress them, it's it. They, they're not going to help you. They're at best. They're just going to walk away and then go report your location to, to someone else. Um, but that'll probably six give eight. you a negative. That'll probably give you a negative on your uh, charisma oh, yeah. check, though. If you, right, like that's yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, certainly yeah yeah that yeah. If you roll three through a five, like. 
like that's like a 20 25 you know for, for mm -hmm. something if you roll a two there's no way they're just not they're not you're, they're unpersuadable because they have other ideas um and then like six through eight the neutral result becomes like dc 15 for most checks and what i find with the neutral result is is that like it has a tendency to lead towards just like sort of nothing outcomes and kind of boring play and they're like well they're eyeing you suspiciously well we eye them suspiciously it's like well let's hit the fast forward button on this you know how long are you going to do that Cameras and so <laughs> on each set of eyes <laughs> <laughs> yeah so usually what i do a six through eight tells me is that the monsters are uncertain of how they're of of of, of like the situation they were caught off guard and I'll give the players a minute or two to respond before I'll re-roll that result and see if something different doesn't come up. And based on how the players respond, I might give upwards of a plus two or minus two, or maybe even plus or minus three bonus on a 2d6 chart, little adjustments, plus one, plus two, no more than plus three, make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and that sets the stage for like, okay, is it even possible to persuade them? Is it possible to intimidate them? Can you even get to like, helpful or friendly results where they're like hey like we we heard about you like, you know we, we've heard of some other monsters uh, that you wipe the floor with them and that's awesome we love that like could we help you out like you guys need some water some torches like safe place to sleep <laughs> you know it's kind of dangerous up there but you should be it's able to dangerous handle it. in this level like <laughs> you know we could guide you <laughs> right mm -hmm. we could tell you where the secret mm -hmm. doors are we could tell you where we yeah we know how much uh, treasure those kobolds have we could tell you the back way in like once you start offering things to players yeah. from monsters that are desirable for the players and are like, yeah, you just listen and talk to these monsters. If you just like hear them out, they have other things they can offer you. And the reaction rule sets the stage for that. The reaction rule says this is a possibility that there's no, yeah. there's no assumed default for combat like the way fifth edition sort of presents it which is that here's a monster we roll initiative it fights to the death it's always hostile it's always aggressive and the reaction role mechanizes and systematizes some of that to say not always sometimes a monster is territorial sometimes they might fight you for a round or two and, and then they're done they just want to make a point you know that, that they, they can't mm -hmm. be pushed over sometimes they're looking for help sometimes they want to be left alone all of those things are possibilities that you don't get with the baseline rules and a reaction yeah. helps you uh, get there. That, that is very true. But uh, sometimes that reaction role, like we said, uh, is going to end up in combat. Yeah, uh, sometimes. And like you were saying, it's like you were saying in 5e, it kind of is the default that they fight to the death, which is always been one of those things that just, I don't know. I never really say anything about it, but it, it breaks my suspension of disbelief, especially if I know that that, that enemy monster whatever it is has an intelligence of more than five yeah i mean like even that doesn't even really matter because even like you know beasts once you injure right. them if sufficiently they run away they lose morale and yeah. that's something uh, yet another vestige of, of older editions that can can sp can spruce up that combat and make it more realistic absolutely absolutely and the, the i'm glad that you sort of bring it up in the context of sprucing up combat because reaction uh, roles and morale contribute not just to creating campaigns where players interact with and talk to monsters more than they do mm -hmm. uh, in baseline you know gameplay or the rules are written but it like varies up combat when you do fight having a monster that's willing to go to the death is different than one that is going to flee once it's bloodied or once it just takes a hit or once the first yeah. once, once one of its friends dies and fifth edition has a, a section in uh, like chapter nine of the DMG under options, like buried in the back of the book under the variant rules is They'll morale. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, right, exactly. And it's a you know it's it's it covers like when might you roll a morale check? What is a morale check? What's a wisdom save versus DC ten, which is at like a fixed DC like that is. I don't, I don't care for it. I probably have like a scaling DC or, or something like that. In older versions of D&D, &D, morale was another 2D6 roll uh, that you rolled under a creature's morale score and, and they'd stay in fight. And typically the conditions were when like the first of their number dies and then went half. And then like if a leader dies or something like that, it would go. Yeah. But morale is one of those things that separates 
to me a, a, a game where we're attempting to like live in this fantasy world. We want we mm -hmm. want to like I, I don't I don't believe in immersion because I I'm always cognizant that I'm playing a game like you know, but I do like the idea of taking the consequences of this world seriously and its inhabitants seriously, and if I've got say intelligent humanoids like kobolds or goblins or orcs or whatever you know bugbears humans elves uh, or beasts or whatever that they don't behave like a mindless murder machine that fights till its yeah. death they value only their life programmed for murder yeah only, <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> only programmed for murder <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um what i found though uh, is that what, as as interesting as as morale is, as satisfying as it can be uh, from from a role play perspective, is that the the players can be very bloodthirsty, and that a lot of players do not like to let enemies run away, and mm -hmm. sometimes that seems to come out of a a place of like, well, we've let that happen before, and then it came to bite us in the ass. You know, they the enemies yeah. returned or we ratted out or whatever, or we took them prisoner and like, now what do we do with them? You know? Mm -hmm. And like, that's on the DM. If the, if a monster flees for me, if I'm running it, if a monster fails their morale roll, they're gone. They left, they fled, right? Yeah. Like they're not gonna come back. You scared them off, <laughs> you know? Um, and similarly, if you take one prisoner and you know get, get the information out of it that you want, like, you could exchange it perhaps you could you know, like hey we have one of your boys like we got some of your your your, your people we can always do an you exchange <laughs> you got some ransom yeah. hey maybe the next time we fight and it goes bad for us you don't kill us and we'll pay for our people back you know and now we're doing yeah. prisoner exchange and ransom and and those sorts of things that we're now inhabiting a world that feels more like more things are on the table in terms of what's going to happen during yeah. the game then yeah yeah and we'll eventually it's, get to the Geneva Convention. So, uh, you know, <laughs> right. seriously, yeah, don't want to mis mistreat them then. <laughs> right. No, you're right. Yeah, the, but you could have something like that where you're like, okay, well, we've agreed. You know, we, we keep tussling with these orcs or, you know, whatever. And now we're, you know, we've decided that, uh, you know, we're, we're not killing anybody. Like, you know, we, mm -hmm. it's just a, a gentleman's agreement, you know, code of honor yeah. kind of thing. Uh, or, or whenever we encounter each other, our, our two best fighters have a duel to sort of like satisfy honor. You know, those yeah, sorts yeah. of things become possible. Oh, th oh my God, that that that's why I like the 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 idea of uh, the Obold uh, mini arrows. Uh, and yeah. The establishment of the orc empire like treat it real where you have to make treaties with these people and yeah. you don't want to just throw your armies just because two scouting parties got into a skirmish like no 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 if you get if you want to fight all right your best guy my best guy and then mm. we walk separate ways at the end of it uh yeah and report yeah. to our people that this happened but you know we Absolutely. we kept with the tusk and tooth accords or whatever you want to call it actually I'm write yeah it yeah um, and it's a good way to highlight those monsters that do stay to fight to the death how terrible they are like in in oh, old yeah. school D D undead are terrifying because they never run away they never stop mm -hmm. fighting you can force a group of of most monsters to run away if if combat goes against them but you've got to kill every one of those skeletons if you don't have a cleric and that's a yeah. chore and every round in you, that you're in combat is a risk and i think that DD plays very well with that even at higher levels even in modern editions of, of saying mm -hmm. like, yeah, if, if after two rounds we could force them to leave, not only can we get more done in a session, right? Not only yeah. can we not have spent so much time in those, in the back half of combat once it's really already been decided and we're just mopping up, like, yeah. what if we just let them run away and now we can do mm -hmm. other things and have other kinds of adventures and yeah. Well, yeah, because <laughs> uh, there, there should be other ways to gain experience other than combat should there not? I mean, Absolutely. does it always have to just be about defeating monsters? I mean, that that's the problem that D&D has created for itself. And it really yeah. is like watching the various editions of D&D's shed parts of the gameplay because the sort of popular conception was that, well, we just fight monsters in this. So did you read the rule book? You don't have to. <laughs> and then the next edition becomes like, wait, they're only giving XP for combat now. Like, yeah. wait, what happened to all the rest of the game? And yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, like it's dungeons and dragons, not <laughs> right. Dragons and right. Dragons. <laughs> Certainly. Right. And you know, 
when you think about it, though, 5th edition has left the door open for having a system for identifying what a challenge is like and then assigning mm -hmm. that a value and awarding XP for it on that. And when you look at it from monsters, it's a very imprecise and, you know, kind of more art than science tool for yeah. gauging how difficult the fight's going to be. And it would be the same for like an exploration encounter or, or something like that. But there's nothing stopping you as a DM from going, all right, well, what level are my players at or their characters are at? You know, how many XP do they need to level? All right, well, let me look at the XP chart and the challenge rating chart, like figure out, okay, well, maybe this is worth like a fifth of their level and this, this thing's worth like half of their level. And you, you know, work from there to assign CR values to it or, or you skip that part and you just sort of use the XP table and the sort of guidelines as a, a rough estimate. And you go like, well, you know, if they force this group of, uh, you know, of, of wolves or wargs or whatever to run away, then you know that's that they defeated them in combat but if they like use a bunch of animal handling and spells and and the like to like win them over how much xp is that worth or when you're dealing with like factions and the like how much xp is intrigue worth how much xp is mm -hmm. is swaying a faction leader to your cause worth that should be worth something that shouldn't just yeah. be nothing it should come with more than just a reward of it happening because of how D D sort of has level progression and XP and all that good stuff. And so like what you award XP for sends a clear signal to your players. This is what I am valuing in this campaign. And this is kind of the default mode of what you should be doing. Currently that's kill monsters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go get with the big chopper. Uh... <laughs> right. Yeah. So like, I won't DACA you experience. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But 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 yeah. that is the thing is if the if the only carrot that you offer the players is is murdering something with the stick, then that is the only thing that they're going to do. And so yeah. like I, I love the idea of of like okay they're going to a dungeon. That dungeon has an experience value. Each room mm -hmm. that they explore, they overcame that trap to get in that room and they found all the treasure. Well, guess what? Yeah. That whole room is worth X experience because they did it. They skipped mm. the the, uh, the secret room and went on to the next room. So like they're not getting that, you know, so yeah. breaking it down into like just just little bits. And then at the end, OK, we we're leaving the dungeon. OK, well, y'all got a grand total of 900 uh, that yeah. that dungeon was worth 1400 and you got most of it. You know, yeah. I wouldn't tell them that because then they'll immediately. Yeah, yeah, in there. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's some things it's OK to kind of sort of keep keep behind the screen uh, in that sense but yeah. there's there's really nothing wrong with going like i've got you know 12 rooms in this level of the dungeon they're each worth like 25 xp just for like getting to them exploring them push yep. further go farther and then yeah. for every secret it's like another maybe 30 or 50 or whatever and then and then you give some xp for fighting right like there should be some fighting it's one of the pillars of the game it's exactly exciting it's, you know and uh but but that like the assumption isn't that uh everything you come across you're gonna fight and to me like that it's a good note to end on because like as i'm sure a lot of our viewers probably have, have uh, you know figured out for themselves like it's hard to do this without talking to your players about what you expect a game to be like right and yeah and what they expect a game to be like and in my experience there are a lot of players who like the idea that you can just kill the monsters without having to worry about it like you know they they got enough morally gray complicated situations going on in their real life the simplicity of that's a giant beastie it doesn't matter that it can talk or has an agenda or whatever like mm -hmm. i've come here to engage in you know uncomplicated <laughs> violent action as part of an escapist fantasy and yes i i don't i personally am not like that's not my preferred way to play dnd &D, but i don't think it's invalid i, I think it's worth having a conversation about and establishing some sort of baseline ground rules and 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 coming yeah. to a, some sort of compromise of like well what can we expect out of the game uh, mm -hmm. you know so that everybody can enjoy it yeah because because you should offer options but if if that's if all they want is mortal combat well then that's a well, great now you know what kind of game to run for them <laughs> yeah let them fight you know like so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs>